A lot of people like to say the late 80s were a dark time for punk music. In a lot of documentaries, you'll hear all your favorite bands from the 90s say how all the punk bands of the previous generation started putting out metal records all of a sudden, and none of the venues were booking punk shows anymore. Although some of this is definitely true, it certainly didn't stop the next generation of punk rock bands from jamming, putting out demos, and playing shows, even if they were just in someone's basement. But most importantly, the late 80s were the beginning of a new era for punk rock, and with it came a number of young and inspired bands that made unique developments on what the previous generation had started. How's it going, folks? My name is Jack Miller. I am the incredibly underqualified punk historian, and in this video, I'm gonna give you guys a little history lesson on the Scott Punk Godbrothers themselves, Operation Ivy. Of course, along with some of my thoughts on why they had such a big impact on punk, and an even bigger one on ska and ska punk. But before we dive into that, I wanna say I do plan on making Spotify playlists for my videos in the future, but that will not be necessary for this one because Operation Ivy has one album, it's right here, and you can find it on any streaming platform you like. Lastly, if you're interested in weekly videos about punk, may I humbly request that you please subscribe to my channel here. I'm having a lot of fun making these, and I want to make sure that all of you can keep having fun watching them. Anyways! The story of Operation Ivy begins in the mid-80s in Albany, California. Founding members Tim Armstrong and Matt Freeman were playing in a local ska band called Basic Radio. The band would put out a couple demo tapes and play shows in the underground Bay Area scene between the years of 1985 and 1987. There's not a whole lot of information about Basic Radio because they were a very short-lived band like Operation Ivy, but there are a few taped live performances that you can find on YouTube along with their 1987 demo, and I will link both of those in the description below. If you're someone like me who enjoys old fuzzy punk recordings, then I recommend you check out the Basic Radio demo. I actually had a lot of fun listening to it, and it's kind of a cool preview to the sound Matt and Tim's music would grow into in their later bands. Moving on though, the year is now 1987, and the original and only lineup of Operation Ivy is now jamming in a garage somewhere in Berkeley, California. Taking their name from a series of nuclear tests carried out by the US government in the 50s, the band consisted of guitarist Tim Armstrong, then known as Lint, vocalist Jesse Michaels, drummer Dave Mello, and bassist Matt Freeman, otherwise known as Matt McCall. The band would play their first live performance in their drummer's garage before beginning a tradition of performances at the famous 94 Gilman Street Punk Club the next day. You'll hear people from that scene describe Operation Ivy as one of those bands that just kind of came out of left field and blew the scene up really quickly, and I have to say I do not doubt that's what happened at all. A lot of bands might take their time to refine themselves a little before they put out music, but that was not the case for Op Ivy. They didn't need to. Their debut single, I Got No, was featured on a compilation by the San Francisco punk scene Maximum Rock and Roll less than a year after their formation in 1987. After after mere months, they signed with Lookout Records in January of 1988 and released their debut 7 inch Hectic that same month. Now, before I jump into the next exciting chapter in the story, I want to emphasize that Operation Ivy was still a brand new band at this point in time. There's enough evidence available online to infer that all the events from their first show in their drummer's garage to the release of their first 7 inch happened in less than a year's time. After winning the How Fast Can You Start a Band and Blow Up race in record time, Operation Ivy was now one of the biggest bands in their hometown scene. The band were frequently packing the house at 924 Gilman, and by mid-1988 they were already selling out reasonably sized venues across America. Though they were approached by a number of major labels, the band chose to stand by their hometown friends at Lookout, and there they would release their classic full-length album, Energy, in 1989. I'm pretty sure if you're watching this video you're familiar with that record, but on the off chance you aren't, I highly recommend you go listen to it as soon as possible, even if it means pausing this video and coming back. Now in typical Op Ivy fashion, the actual recording process of Energy is an entire epic of its own. Following one of their most successful tours in the summer of 1988, the band met with Lookout Records owners Larry Livermore and David Hayes to discuss plans for a follow-up release to Hectic. The label owners suggested Operation Ivy release another 7-inch EP as they were afraid the band was not ready to do a full length and were also unsure if the label could successfully fund it. Despite their best efforts though, nothing had stopped Operation Ivy from doing whatever the hell they wanted in the past, and the label owners were certainly not an exception to that rule. Live recording sessions for the album began at the 924 Gilman venue of all places, in hopes the band could capture the same energy of some of their live shows there. Although these ideas were definitely well intended, the band was not able to emulate the same sound of a performance to a packed house recording alone in the venue during closed hours. Gilman sound engineer Radley Hirsch, who had been assigned the producer role, also pushed for a series of ideas that the band was not thrilled about. And in the end, the recordings were not what Operation Ivy or the label owners had been hoping for. By the end of 1988, things were not looking good for this album. But after a little bit of persuasion, Larry Livermore did agree to start the project over from scratch. The album was produced by Kevin Army at Sound and Vision Studios in January of 1989, and was then released four months later in May. Since they were so well rehearsed from touring and drilling the songs during the recording sessions at Gilman, the band actually recorded the entire album during one live recording session at Sound and Vision. As they say though, all good things must come to an end, and unfortunately Operation Ivy was another one of those things. The band had an album release show booked at Gilman on May 28, 1989. 
The show is to include a number of other Berkeley hometown heroes, such as Crip Shrine, The Lookouts, and Green Day. However, just two weeks before that show, Jesse Michaels told his bandmates Tim Armstrong and Matt Freeman that he felt the band wasn't what it had been when they first started, and he felt that they weren't into it anymore. After deciding to part ways on good terms, the record release show would inevitably become Operation Ivy's last public performance. However, the band did play one final show at a private house party hosted by their friend Robert Eggplant the following day. The next chapters in this story, of course, involve the formation of Matt Freeman and Tim Armstrong's next band, Rancid, as well as the various other musical and art-related projects Jesse Michaels has been in over the years, but both of those things are topics for future videos of their own. Instead, I think it's more important that I make note of the enormous legacy this relatively obscure and short-lived band left behind. It's rare when a single album is able to redefine an entire musical genre, and even more so when said album comes from an artist with a career as short as Operation Ivy's was. If you ask me, I think this is something that only happens once or twice in a genre, and for some genres it may never. I'm definitely going to do entire videos on ska punk, third wave ska, and ska core, so I'll talk about this a lot more there, but I think it's pretty safe to say that none of those genres would even exist had it not been for Operation Ivy. Before their debut, ska music had primarily been a Jamaican and English phenomenon. There certainly were American ska bands in the 80s, but they were vastly outnumbered by those from Jamaica and the United Kingdom. Not to mention the audience for ska and reggae in the 80s didn't always overlap with punk. Operation Ivy not only sold the American punk audience on this fairly foreign genre, but they completely reinvented it in the process. After the release of Energy in 89, ska and ska punk fans began popping up left, right, and center in the American punk scene. And for a while, punk rock and third wave ska almost shared the stage 50-50 amongst the same fan base. But like I was saying, the various breeds of ska, reggae, and ska punk are topics for at least five different videos on their own. So I'll definitely go into more detail on those genres in the future. All that said though, there's a chance if you're watching this, you're someone who doesn't even like ska, and you're just an Operation Ivy fan because they're a classic punk band. Of course, if you are that person, there's nothing wrong with that as we all have our own opinions, but the fact that you go as far to say that you hate ska but would still consider yourself an Operation Ivy fan really says something about their impact on music as a whole. Well, I think that about does it on our little history lesson here. Fun fact about me, I actually play guitar in a ska core band and Operation Ivy is one of our biggest influences. But I think that's enough on my end. I want to hear what you guys have to say. What are your favorite Operation Ivy songs? Do you agree that they invented ska punk as we know it? Or do you think the genre would still have had a presence without them? Or if you're someone who doesn't even like Scott, what attracts you to Operation Ivy's music? Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you next time.